Take a moment and pray with me, please. Lord, let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart be pleasing unto you. Fill my lungs with your breath, my mouth with your message. Let all that I say, let all that I do bring honor and glory to you and to you alone. In the precious name of Jesus, amen. So I want to start today with a few words about our reading, which we all know as the Lord's Prayer. Some may call it the Our Father. Whatever you call it, it is important to know what it really is, is considered a pattern prayer. Because it teaches us. You'll notice that Jesus doesn't say this is what you should say when you pray. He's saying this is how you should pray. It teaches us to whom we should address our prayers. Who do we pray to? Our Father, who art in heaven. Then it tells us to worship and to praise God for who he is. Hallowed be your name. Hallowed meaning holy, blessed, sanctified, sacred, respected. I think you get the picture. And then it goes on to say, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven reminds us to pray for God's plan in our life, not for our own plan in our life. We are encouraged to ask God for things that we need. The prayer is give us this day our daily bread. And now the tough one, verse 12, forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors, or forgive us our trespasses as we have forgiven those who trespassed against us. But yet, if you look at Luke chapter 11, it says, forgive us our sins, for also we forgive everyone who sins against us. Whether you say debts, trespasses, sins, they mean the same thing. When interpreted, they all remind us that we need to come to God in confession. We need to turn to God. We also need to forgive others. And we need to be thankful that God continues to forgive us. And then we have the final verse of God to, to give human beings the strength to overcome the devil's schemes. You remember from last week, I hope, that I said, God doesn't give us trouble or illness. He gives us the strength to deal with the troubles and illnesses we have. Amen? Amen. But wait, that's really not the final verse that when we say it, because we add, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. So while the phrase is absent from the earliest Greek Bible manuscripts, it is present indeed in the majority of the later Greek manuscripts. And an increased number of theological writings as time went on continue to have that final phrase. As a hospice chaplain, I deal obviously with people of no religion and many religions, but if you are Roman Catholic, you do not say that last sentence. So I have to remember when I'm saying the Lord's Prayer with somebody who's Roman Catholic, they suddenly stop and start talking, I'm still praying. So I always have to remember, stop, 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 don't forget where to stop. Have to be, have that on my mind. So that's my overview of the Lord's Prayer. But today, I want to talk again about something that I've talked about, yes, a hundred times. But I think for myself and possibly for you as well, we all need the reminder about forgiveness. So I thought, let's talk about some extreme forgivenesses. So the first one I looked up, I think I have four. The first one I looked up, I don't know if anybody remembers this, and I didn't until I read it. But in 2003, Shante Mallard was sentenced by a Texas court to 50 years in prison for murder of Gregory Biggs. She also got an additional 10 years for tampering with evidence related to the case. You see, Biggs was a homeless gentleman, and he was struck by Mallard in, with her car. He crashed through her windshield and remained stuck in the windshield as she continued to drive. And although she claimed that she was in an altered state due to drugs and alcohol that she had consumed, her crime is still unimaginable. See, the aspect of the crime isn't that so much that she hit this gentleman and killed him, but he didn't have to die. Testimony revealed that Biggs could have survived if he had received medical attention. However, she drove home, 
with his body through her windshield, parked her car in her garage, and went to bed. And there he suffered the rest of the night and died. At the conclusion of the trial, Big's only son, Brandon, stated to Mallard and to the court that he forgave her for allowing his father to die. Mallard responded with tears and silence. Wow, that's some extreme forgiveness. On May 13, 1981, the unthinkable happened in Rome in St. Peter's Square with Pope John Paul II, one of the most beloved figures at the time, was shot. There were four shots fired, two wounding the Pope, two more wounding people in the crowd. The Pope was seriously injured. I don't know if anybody remembers this. It took five hours of surgery to save him. The would-be assassin was only 23 years old, just a young man from Turkey, who had joined a radical terrorist group with a pension for the assass assassination of leaders of this country. The young man's personal uh, motivations were never truly made clear, but the Pope wasted no time into putting uh, forgiveness into practice. The Pope publicly forgave the man on May 17th and then even went to visit him in prison. Now you may think, okay, he's the Pope, so he, he's got to forgive this. He's got to do what the Bible says. Well, he doesn't have to do it any more than you or I have to do it. We are all children of God and are called to do that. My third extreme forgiveness is the Amish. We all know how much I like the Amish people. But remember when their lifestyle was ravaged when that terrible day in 2007, when Charles Roberts, the milk truck driver, went into the school and killed a lot of children. I think there were five little girls who were killed. And it was believed that he was acting out in anger against God because his child had died. The families actually, the um, Amish families immediately went to uh, Robert's house to provide comfort to his wife and to his children because they said they must be suffering too for what he did to other people. That again is extreme forgiveness. And the last one is the Green River Serial Killer. I was into all these like <clears throat> scary things this week. During the 1980s, a rash of serial killings of young girls plagued the West Coast. Gary Ridgway was arrested, tried, convicted, and sentenced. Robert and Linda Roll's daughter, Linda Jane, young 16-year-old girl, was killed. Now they had every reason to be upset and totally um, non-forgiving of this this man for killing their daughter. But at sentencing, the families of all the other people spewed hate and wanted revenge upon this guy. But Mr. Rule said, Mr. Ridgway, there are people here that hate you, and I'm not one of them because I offer you forgiveness. Forgiveness for murdering his 16-year-old little girl. That is extreme forgiveness. I can almost guarantee you that each and every one of us here has been hurt mentally or physically by someone in our lifetime. And most likely, even though not intentionally, we may have been the cause of hurting someone else. Perhaps the most powerful example of forgiveness is that of Jesus Christ. He came to his own people, John records, and his own people did not receive him. His miracles and bread attracted the crowds, but when he had something to say that, that was hard for them, they would leave as quick as they would come. John 6, verse 66. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him because they didn't like maybe something he said. A number of times when he said something that they didn't consider kosher, well, then they just tried to kill him. But he slipped away from their grasp. But the time finally came that God had planned, as in Galatians 4, verses 4 and 5. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. 
This time when his enemies sought to arrest him, he stood forth and he said, I am he. And he allowed them to take him. He allowed that mock trial to continue with all its false and unsupported charges. He could have called legions of angels to deliver him. The armies of heaven were at his back and call, but he did not. Soldiers spit in his face. They mocked him with a cruel crown of thorns and a purple robe. They said made him look like a king. They scourged him to death. Everybody know what scourged means? It really means being whipped into great suffering. So they whipped him almost to the point of death. Pilate washed his hands and ordered the crucifixion. And as they crucified him, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. If we are to know and understand God, we must love. We must know and understand forgiveness. If we reject this part of God, then we reject the basis of who God really is. Because God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete amongst us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. So when Jesus puts it so bluntly in our passage from Matthew, you must forgive to be forgiven, my point is we dare not reject that truth. To be set free, you must let go of unforgiveness. Is, unforgive is that your ticket to get into heaven because you forgive somebody? No, sorry. Not any more than the repentance of sin is your ticket either. We don't earn heaven by repentance or by forgiveness. We are given that gift of grace from Jesus. But we do need to learn to let go of the bondage of sin and hate if we want to receive things that are even better, the things that Jesus has planned for us and intends for our lives. True forgiveness does not minimize the sin or the hurt, nor does it excuse the sinner. I want to say that again because so many people say, I can't forgive them because it really hurt what they did. Yes, forgiving them doesn't say it did not hurt or how awful it was that they did that. You may be freshly wounded right now from find anger too massive to even begin to comprehend forgiveness. Maybe there's an injustice going on in your life, an outrage that's constant that you can't get a grip of. Perhaps you not you feel like, I just can't do it right now, Pastor. I just can't forgive. Then if that is where you are, I'm going to ask you to say these words. Lord, I need your help. I know I need to forgive, and I'm struggling. Please help me. The God of forgiveness answers all prayers and will certainly answer that one and help you forgive. Because he makes a way when there is no way. He takes us beyond ourselves. Forgiveness doesn't mean forgetting or excusing, and I cannot say that too many times. It also doesn't necessarily mean making up with the person and having them over for dinner. That doesn't mean that isn't what forgiveness is. Forgiveness brings a, a kind of peace that allows you to focus on yourself and helps you move on in life. Science has proven that letting go of grudges and bitterness can make way for improved health and peace of mind. Forgiveness, scientifically, can lead to the following. Healthier relationships, improved mental health, less stress, anxiety, and hostility. Fewer symptoms of depression, lower blood pressure, a stronger immune system, an improved, improved heart health, and improved self-esteem. Now, who among all of us would not like to have improved health? We, I preach this all the time, almost probably every day as a hospice chaplain, because this is a huge part of what we call self-care. As much as caregivers are always taking care of other people. 
And we all have people that we take care of. You have to take care of yourself as well. And that means emotionally and spiritually and physically. Being hurt by someone, particularly someone you love, someone you trust, can cause anger, sadness, and confusion. But if you dwell on those hurtful events, grudges filled with resentment and hostility will take root in your heart. If you allow yourself negative feelings to crowd out the positive love of Christ, you might find yourself swallowed up in bitterness. When we forgive, we experience and extend the love of God. When we forgive as he has forgiven us, we reflect his heart. We stand up for righteousness when we forgive. I've already said that forgiving someone does not mean that you approve of what they did. Please hear that. Rather, it means that we make a conscious decision to choose to let God be the one who determines the appropriate course of action in dealing justly with the offending person. We don't ignore sin when we forgive. When we forgive, we welcome the Holy Spirit's continuing process of conforming us in the image of Jesus Christ. To forgive is to be like Jesus and forgiving others is evidence of that ongoing sanctification. When we forgive, we break one of the enemy's holds on our lives. Satan and his forces, they want us to be angry and bitter and unforgiving, and they want us to seek revenge. But when we do forgive, we dislodge that grip Satan has on us. When we do forgive, we experience the heart and the freedom of grace. Frankly, it's painful and consuming to hold on to heartache. On the other hand, there's nothing quite like the freedom and the joy we experience when we can release yesterday's pain. When we, <clears throat> excuse me, when we forgive, we let go of maybe an idol in our lives. Because if we choose to hold on to unforgiveness, when the Bible calls us very, very clearly to forgive, then we're walking in disobedience. We're not doing as Jesus has called us to do. We're choosing to hold on to anger as something of an, um, that we idolize as opposed to Christ. When we forgive, we open the door to God's forgiveness. <clears throat> Jesus is very clear when he says if we don't forgive others, our own relationship with God is hindered. Then our granting forgiveness is not only a mark of God's love in us, but it's also to experience God's grace. When we forgive, we are witnesses to the world. Few things show the transforming power of the gospel, like forgiving your enemy. Folks can't understand the love <clears throat> that genuinely loves. And last but not least, when we forgive, we sleep a whole lot better. Because <laughs> we don't lay there at night, right? Running it through our head over and over and over again. We often find our purpose through trials. And there's certainly purpose in forgiveness. In Matthew 22, 37 to 40, Jesus gives us two great commandments to fulfill the law. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and love your neighbors as yourself. Well, how can you love Jesus with all your heart if you have a piece of your heart that's holding on to anger or hurt or unforgiveness? You see, our purpose in life is founded in, <clears throat> in these two commandments. And the foundation is, again, love. Per the pure <clears throat> love definition is found in 1 Corinthians 13. I'm sure you all know it. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does, keeps no record of wrongdoing. It keeps no record of wrongdoing. 
Let go of those grudges. Stop being mad at something that happened six months ago. Let it go. Love is always helpful and endures through every circumstance. If you love someone, chances are you're going to need to forgive them at some point in your relationship, and they you. And when you're forced to face that choice to forgive, remember the commandment. It's not just the suggestion to forgive. Or, you know, if you can get around to it, go ahead and forgive. It is a commandment. We are commanded by Jesus Christ to forgive. Now I think for the hardest part in some, for some of us, one of the hardest people to forgive, perhaps, is yourself. How many people carry guilt with them from years and years and years ago for something they did? But we've all done crazy, stupid. You know, we're all sinners, amen? Yeah. We're all sinners. We all carry that with us. But if we continue to beat ourselves up for it day after day after day, then we're not following the commandment to forgive. And I think sometimes we say, okay, I forgive this person, but then I don't know what happens. Some, somehow in our humanness, in our human nature, whether we have a dream, whether somebody makes a comment, whether you see something or hear something and it brings up that old heart hurt, and then what happens? You start festering on it. You start thinking about it again and again and again. And there it is, maybe five years later, maybe 20 years later. And that's why forgiveness is so hard because it's not just a once and done, slam the door, I'm out of here. It's something ongoing. When that happens to you, remember it is the commandment to forgive, and that includes forgiving yourself for your wrongdoings. God has set these commandments in place for our good and for his glory. Love is a fruit of the Spirit, as found in Galatians 5.22, which says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, Joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Our purpose is to love. It's to love others and to love ourselves. Forgiveness is one of the most powerful, powerful ways that we can show the love of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Please join me now in praying the prayer that Jesus taught us so long ago. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing song today is My Hope is Built. We picked all good oldies today. Number 368 in your hymnal. The words will be on the screen. If you're comfortable and able, please rise.
more forgiving and more loving. Amen? Amen. 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 Go in peace and fellowship is in the hall. Thank you.